Hey guys, happy Wednesday. Hope everybody is doing well out there today. Uh, in today's video, we're going to continue the Turing Pi video series uh, that we started on Monday. And today, uh, what I'm gonna show you how to do is actually flash uh, two different types of compute modules. Uh, there'll be uh, one with an eMMC flash and then one with no eMMC flash, but with an SD card instead. Once we've got that done, we'll go ahead and change the host name of the compute units. And then we'll actually go so far as to create a Docker cluster cluster today. Okay, so let's go ahead and switch camera angles up here a little bit and go through the process of flashing an operating system onto a compute unit. Now, one thing I do want to say here is that I'm going to be using an operating system called Hyperiot. It's H-Y-P-R-I-O-T. Uh, it was actually suggested to me from the folks at Touring Pi, and uh, I've been using it for a few days and actually really like it. So uh, let's go ahead and switch camera angles and get started. Okay, so here we've got our board. Uh, the first thing we have to do is plug a compute unit into the first slot. And then we have to uh, switch this jumper over so that they're staggered. Uh, you'll always wanna make sure you switch that jumper unit over. And then what we need to do is plug in the micro USB cable into the slave port right here. And now we're ready to go. Okay, so the next thing we need to do is actually come over here uh, to this GitHub page that will be linked in the description down below. And what we need to do is download this RPI boot underscore setup. Uh, of course, this is all gonna be done on Windows. Uh, if you've got a different system, I can't help you here, but this is uh, what we're going to use for the sake of this video. Uh, so go ahead and download and install the RPI boot underscore setup program. Okay, so now that we've got our compute unit installed and our jumper is set, we can open RPI boot. And once it's open, then we can actually plug in our Turing Pi. So now we should see a bit of a sequence on the RPI boot uh, program here. And then in just a moment, this will disappear. And then we can actually open up uh, this computer or my computer, and we should see a couple of new drives in there. The problem is we can't really do much with them. So what I'm gonna do is go into manager and actually delete the partitions that are on uh, that compute unit EMMC. And then we can actually go through the process of flashing the operating system. So we'll go ahead and delete uh, these two partitions here, uh, just like so. And sometimes you gotta click that twice for some reason. And then we'll go ahead, once that's deleted, we'll go ahead and create a new partition. Um, and that way, uh, Win32 Disk Imager or whatever imaging software you wanna use, uh, will rec recognize the drive and then we can actually flash the unit. So here you can see now that we've only got uh, one drive in there. It doesn't matter that it's not formatted, uh, but what we're gonna do is come over here, we can uh, select drive H, we'll go to our uh, IMG file, which is gonna be uh, Hyperite again, and then we'll click on Write. I'll say yes, and then we'll give this some time to do its thing. Now, remember, this is going over USB 2 over a micro USB cable, so this will take a little while. So hang out, get comfortable, go grab a cup of coffee, whatever the case may be, and uh, then you can come back and move on. Okay, so now that the flashing is done, you can go ahead and unplug the power, and then unplug the slave port USB and reset the jumpers. Okay, so now that that's done, you can go ahead and plug the power back in uh, and make sure you give it a couple of minutes to boot up and that sort of thing. Uh, I like to actually have a, a monitor plugged in so that I can see uh, when the boot sequence is done. But then once that's done and it's booted up, log into your router to grab your IP address for that device. And then we're gonna come back and log in via SSH. Okay, so now that we've got our IP address, we can go ahead and type that in and press open. Uh, you may be required to uh, agree to this warning here. Go ahead and do that and then log in as your uh, as your operating system root user. In this case, I'm gonna log in as Pirate with the login or with the password of PyPriot. And uh, then we're gonna do just a quick update. Uh, once this is done, we'll do an upgrade and then we'll go ahead and move on from there. Okay, so it's at this point that I like to change the host name of my compute units. Uh, as I discovered though, this is not how to do it in Hyperiot, but this should work with your Raspberry OS uh, setups. Uh, as long as you're using Raspberry Pi OS or a Raspbian uh, offshoot, uh, this is, should work to change the host name. But for uh, for Hyperiot, this is not how to do it. Okay, so that's the process for flashing an operating system onto a compute unit with an eMMC chip. Now let's take a look at the process of flashing an operating system onto a, a non on eMMC chip. This is actually super simple. We're gonna plug an SD card in or a micro SD card in, flash the SD card and we're done. So very simple process, but I'm gonna show it anyway. Okay, so here you can see that I've got two partitions. I really can't use either one of them. So I'm gonna delete both of them, create a new partition that Win32 Disk Imager can use. And then we'll go ahead and flash our 
our operating system onto the micro SD card. Uh, it's the same process as before, but this time it's gonna go much, much faster because this is attached via USB 3. Okay, so now that you've flashed your micro SD card, you can go ahead and plug in your compute unit and the micro SD card into the Turing Pi. Make sure you do this in slot one and uh, then go ahead and power everything on. Then you're gonna go through that same process of getting the IP address, uh, doing your updates, changing your host name, that sort of thing. I'm not gonna show that because I already did once, uh, but it's the same process, but make sure you put your, your compute unit without the eMMC chip and the micro SD card in slot one, power it up, and then go through that same process again. Also, make sure your jumpers are not staggered uh, when you power everything on. Uh, it won't hurt anything, but it just won't boot properly. So just make sure your jumpers are not staggered. Okay, so now we've covered the processes of uh, flashing an operating system onto either type of compute module. So you're gonna wanna repeat this process uh, as many times as you've got compute modules, depending on what kind of compute modules you have. Uh, once you've got all that done, you can actually go ahead and plug in all of your compute modules into uh, the different slots on your board. And uh, then we're ready to actually jump in and start doing some stuff with uh, the Turing Pi. Okay, so here we are back on my desktop and you can see that I've got PuTTY open and I'm using PuTTY specifically in this instance because it allowed me to store uh, the, the IP addresses of each of my different compute modules uh, as its own profile so it's easier for me to log into each one. So I've gone ahead and done that. Uh, the first thing that we're gonna do here uh, is open up compute uh, unit one. I'm gonna log in. Uh, the username and password for uh, HyperIA is the login is, or the username is pirate and then HyperIA uh, for the password, and there we are. So now the next thing that we're gonna do here uh, is we're going to run this command. This is sudo docker swarm initiate. We're gonna advertise the address of our compute unit uh, for our compute unit number one. So we'll go ahead and do that just to initiate the swarm. Uh, so next thing we wanna do, so the next thing we wanna do is actually create a token uh, to, to uh, attach a couple of swarm managers. And uh, if you're wondering what a swarm manager does, uh, it dispatches units of work called tasks to worker nodes. Managers also perform the orchestration and cluster management functions required to maintain the desired state of the swarm. Manager nodes elect a single leader to conduct orchestration tasks. So that's pretty simple. So we're actually gonna have a total, we're actually gonna do uh, two of these uh, manager nodes. Uh, so uh, let's see, we're gonna go ahead and run uh, sudo docker swarm join token manager. So we're gonna go ahead and run that. And then we've got our, our next command that we're going to run here. Uh, so what I'll do is uh, copy that, and then I'll go ahead and open uh, PuTTY again in another window. I'm gonna open uh, Compute Unit 2, and I'm gonna log in. Like so, and then I'm just gonna go ahead and paste in that command and press Enter. So now this node has joined the swarm as a manager. Good deal. Uh, now we can close that. I actually like to have uh, two node managers. Uh, so what I'll do is I'll open this one up and I'll go to uh, compute unit three. Uh, and again, I'm gonna log in like so. And then I'm gonna run that same command. And now this node has joined as a manager as well. So now we've got a couple of managers uh, to help facilitate any of the instructions on the cluster. Now, the next thing we wanna do is actually uh, generated token for our workers. Now in this case, we're gonna have a few workers. So I'm gonna go ahead and paste in uh, that command, which is sudo docker swarm uh, join token worker. Again, we're specifying worker here instead of manager. So it's given us this new command. So I'm just gonna go ahead, oops, and uh, copy this like so. And then I'll go ahead and open this up. Now we've, we're logged into one and we've made two and three managers. So now we're gonna go to four and I'm gonna come up here, I'm gonna log in. And then I'm going to join as a worker in this case, so that's done. So we did that for four. Now we'll do the same for uh, five, six, and seven. So I'll just knock those out real quick and then we'll come back. Okay, so now we've got all of our uh, nodes talking to each other on a swarm. So the first thing we wanna do, uh, in my opinion, is actually uh, install a swarm visualizer. So, and what I found is um, over here on uh, GitHub, there's this script right here for running on ARM. 
So I'm gonna go ahead and minimize this and I'm just gonna paste that in there and I'm gonna say go. It's gonna think about it for just a moment here. Here we can see that it's uh, everything seems to be going there. So now it's gonna verify that all of the tasks are stable. All right, so then if we drag this up, I went to port 8080 and here we can see that the visualizer is running on a command or is running on uh, node number one. So that's good. Uh, in fact, in here, we actually told it that it needed to be run on a manager node. Um, and you can actually uh, decide whether or not you want it to be on a manager or a worker or whatever the case may be. But by default, the script has it working on a manager node. Okay, so the next thing we're gonna do is actually install another application, but this one is going to have an application and a database running uh, on it. So what we're gonna do uh, is we're going to go ahead and create uh, a directory. So we'll make a directory. Gonna, oops. Oh, it helps if I give it uh, book stack like so. And we'll do a CD book stack. And there's nothing in there. So what we're gonna do is uh, nano uh, docker uh, compose.yml. And then I've got this uh, over here uh, on a, a, a GitHub. Okay, so here we've got uh, what looks to be like a very normal stack, except that in both the top, in this, uh, the book stack, as well as the database, uh, we've actually got um, uh, this extra little bit here that's under deploy for replicas, um, parallelism, uh, delay, and uh, the restart policy. Uh, that's kind of the standard that I've been using and, and had good luck with. So I've got both of those in here. Uh, if you want to know more about uh, the different things that you can do under deploy, uh, there's actually a link that I'll throw in here uh, for parallelism, de delay, order, things like that. Uh, so that will be available uh, also uh, in the description down below. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to copy all of this. And then what I'll do is I'll paste this in here. But, oops, I need to change one thing that I just realized. Um, right up here, this Linux server. And I'll just go to the end of this line and delete this. And paste that in there. So uh, basically all of this is the same. We've got our Bookstack version, or version 3. It has to be version 3 in here. Uh, if it's not, it won't work. Uh, the image we've got uh, is going to be Linux server book stack. Uh, replicas, we're going to do one. Uh, that's how many uh, different nodes you'd like this to, be, to be distributed on. We're just going to do one for right now. Uh, parallelism is how many to update. Uh, delay is five seconds. And then the restart policy is on failure. Uh, we've got our PUID, PGID, all of our database stuff here. Uh, our ports, uh, the restart and let's stop actually isn't going to do anything uh, on this setup. And then basically all the same stuff uh, down here. Now we will need to create some volumes here. And that's one of the differences, I guess I should mention. Uh, if we come up to here, we can see that uh, our volume, oops, for uh, both the configuration and the database are, uh, are both set up to be in volumes. Uh, the reality is that's the only way I figure out how to get this to work is by setting up a volume. So you will wanna make sure that whatever you've got for compute unit one has a large available, uh, hard drive space on it. So I've actually got 128 gig micro SD card on uh, uh, compute unit one. Uh, if you know how to make this work uh, using uh, an actual path, definitely let me know. I'm interested in figuring that out. I just haven't got that far yet, but I've had a lot of success uh, using volumes this way. So I've got a book stack volume. And then down here, I've also got a database volume. And then I've declared both of those down here. Uh, so we'll go ahead and uh, go ahead and write that and then exit out. Okay, so now that we've got our Docker Compose file uh, created, what we're gonna do is run another command. This is a Docker stack deploy. Uh, we're gonna use the compose file, docker-compose.yml, and then we're going to uh, attach book stack to that. So we'll go ahead and uh, click enter. So here it says, un uh, ignoring unsupported option restart. That's fine. Uh, so we'll go ahead and give this a little bit to do its thing, but what I'll do is go ahead and drag this out uh, like so. And then we'll do a Docker service ls. And here you can see that uh, these are the services that we're running. So it doesn't necessarily create containers uh, as much anymore as it does services. And what we're looking for here is once it says replicas one, uh, it should be good to go there. So we'll go ahead and uh, give that a look as well. Uh, so what we're gonna do, uh, sometimes things get stuck um, and they don't like to uh, replicate uh, as it shows here. So what we're gonna do uh, is we're going to say uh, Docker service scale. Um, and then we're going to say uh, uh, bookstack bookstack underscore db equals two. 
we'll say go. We'll give this a second to do its thing. Uh, here you can see, now, now we're up and running. Uh, so now it's gonna verify that everything is good to go. Now we've actually got two instances of the database running at the moment. I really only want one. So what I'm gonna do is change that back to one. Um, so now it's gonna wait five seconds. Uh, this is just a little trick I've learned uh, that kind of helps get past that little hiccup that happens from time to time, scale up, give it a second, then scale back down. And now we should be good to go here. And right up here in the service, as we can see that we're running on port 6875. So I'm gonna go over here, go 68, oops, 6875. And uh, nothing may happen for a moment, but we'll give this a minute uh, to think and do its thing. Uh, and then here in it, within the next couple of minutes, this screen should refresh and we should be on the book stack uh, login screen. So we'll give it a minute to do its thing and then we'll come back. And as promised, within just a couple of minutes, uh, everything popped up. Uh, we're, now we're good to go so we can log in. We can go to admin at um, admin.com and password. So now we're logged into Bookstack on our Turing Pi Swarm. And if we come over to here, uh, we can see that uh, we've got our visualizer running on node one. We've got our uh, Bookstack application running on uh, worker six or node six. And we've got our database on node seven. So that's kind of one of the cool ways that it's able to distribute the workload across the network or across these nodes uh, to give the best possible performance. Um, as you add, start adding more and more applications, uh, things will start to stack and look, and, and, and you'll actually see multiple applications on each uh, worker. Uh, but for right now, we've got two applications running on three stacks. Okay, so yesterday I posted a picture or a couple of pictures of this setup on social media. So definitely follow me on uh, Twitter, Reddit, Facebook, wherever. Uh, that's where I posted all this stuff. But here you can see uh, the Turing Pi setup in this nice little ITX case. Uh, I picked up this case um, for about 30 or 40 bucks on Amazon. I also picked up a couple of uh, these fans. Uh, they were like 10 bucks a piece, but they are actually if you look back here, uh, powered over USB. So they're five volt fans that actually do a pretty good job of moving air across the system. Uh, somebody did notice uh, in one of the pictures yesterday that this is kind of high up uh, and may not give the best airflow over these units. But uh, if I ever discovered these are not getting the airflow that they need, uh, I can actually just go ahead and uh, come up with some kind of a cowl or uh, something to go from, you know, like the, uh, where, there it is from you know, like the top of the fan down uh, to really direct the air uh, into that area to get them uh, a bit more airflow. But uh, this, like I said, is just a mini ITX case um, and, and it's just held in with four screws. Uh, one thing I will say is earlier when I was putting, earlier in the video when I was putting these uh, nodes in, you saw the board flex a bunch. Uh, once it's actually in a case like this, there's basically no flex. So I, I definitely recommend putting this in a case before you start dropping nodes in there. Um, so what else? Oh, I've also got uh, a 120 gig, I think, uh, uh, SSD uh, plugged in via USB. Uh, that's via USB 3, not that it matters because all of the ports on the Turing Pi are USB 2. Uh, but that's how I've got my uh, additional storage mounted up there. Uh, but again, I am still running into some issues with permissions uh, regarding Docker swarms and uh, additional storage. But uh, this is uh, what it looks like without uh, the, the shroud on it. There is a, a shroud that goes over the top that uh, encloses everything. But that is uh, what my Touring Pi setup looks like in the case. Okay guys, there you go. We've actually covered quite a bit in this video. Uh, we went ahead and flashed operating systems onto our nodes. We put all of our nodes and our SD cards uh, in the uh, in the Touring Pi. Uh, we actually got uh, a Docker Swarm up and running and actually installed a couple of different applications. And of course, I kind of gave you the tour of my Touring Pi in the case. Uh, so we covered quite a bit in this video. If you made it this far, thank you. I really do appreciate it. Uh, it means a lot that you're, uh, that you're committed enough to make it like 19 minutes into this video. Um, but I think I kind of covered everything that I wanted to cover in this video, at least for now. Uh, definitely let me know if you've got questions or comments or anything like that. Uh, let put all of that in the description or the, the comment section, not the description, the comment section down below. Um, and of course, I will have links and, and everything in the description down below to check all of that out. And of course, uh, if you want to support the channel, there will be a coffee link and a Patreon link down there as well. Uh, that with Patreon, there are four different levels at which you can subscribe. Uh, the three, five, and ten dollar levels will give you access uh, to my content when it's available early. Uh, and otherwise, uh, it'll just come out at 1.15 uh, Monday, Wednesday, and Friday uh, Mountain Time. 
Um, but I think that kind of covers everything. Oh, also the five and $10 levels give you access uh, to a patrons only discord server. That's what I forgot to mention there, but that pretty much covers everything I wanted to say in this video. I hope to hear it from you guys in the comments, but I'm going to go ahead and wrap this thing up here. As always, thanks for your time. I always appreciate your support and I'll talk to you in the next video.